Okay, hello everyone. So this is the cell cycle lecture from the Human Genetics Level 1 module, the University of Bradford. So what we're going to be talking about for the next 45 minutes or so is the cell cycle. So we'll start with a, I guess a historical slide which kind of puts the context of the cell cycle uh, across to you. Uh, what it is and why it's important before we're going on, going on to discuss the different stages of the cell cycle and explain how uh, cell division can be broken down into these different um, stages which are very tightly regulated by the cell during cell growth. Intimately linked to that is um, the process of DNA replication. So one of the key elements of the cell cycle is the control of DNA replication, the decision to and control of the replication of the genome in the cell. Some more historical um, information relating to how the, if you like, main engine that's responsible for driving the cell cycle was originally discovered. Uh, one or two historical classic experiments relating to that discovery. Uh, that discovery being the identification of a very special and important group of proteins called cyclin-dependent kinases. So these uh, cyclin-dependent kinases are the uh, heartbeat of the cell cycle, if you like. I'm going to consider the concept of cell cycle checkpoints, explain why they're important, and uh, give a couple of examples of how they work, and then finally summarise. So this lecture might be a little different to some of the others on the module. As I mentioned in the module introduction, I'm aware there's a little bit of crosstalk and uh, repetition in some of the module content with what would have been taught to you uh, on the A-level syllabus. It's my suspicion that the cell cycle information today is going to be pretty much new to most students. So um, it can be a relatively challenging lecture in that regards. Uh, and I would advise that you have a look at the chapter on this in the recommended textbook um, if you struggle to keep up during the lecture itself. So let's start with a quote then from Schwann who discovered the Schwann cells, uh, as you may or may not know. This is from the 19th century. And what Schwann said is he said that um, cell division is the only path to immortality. Non-dividing cells can live for as long as 100 years, but eventually they will always die. So when he's talking about non-dividing cells, he's probably referring to some of the neurons and um, cardiac cells that uh, we have in our bodies, which are in a constant state of, if you like, stasis. They're not undergoing division. It's the reason why if you're unfortunate enough to suffer severe spinal injury, those kind of cells are incapable of regenerating because they're simply, put quite simply, they never grow and divide. But obviously we're mortal, all living things are mortal, and eventually um, will die and, and cease to exist. So as Swan's saying here that the only way to actually achieve true immortality is to continually uh, divide and produce new cells. Uh, this is a uh, kind of intimately linked this concept of immortality as well with the uh, phenomenon of cancer. So often cancer cells are referred to as immortalized cell lines. So cancer occurs when cell division, if you like, is goes the other way, the other extreme, where it's continuous and unregulated, where cells just divide and divide and divide, in, in potentially forever. So. It's no great contextual leap on your part to understand that it's really very important we get a, an accurate grasp on how the cell cycle, how this process of cell division is, is regulated by the cell because a better understanding of how cell cycle is regulated and how cell division is regulated will hopefully inform a better understanding of how cancer affects us as a disease and obviously cancer is one of the major diseases uh, that, inf uh, that affects at least western populations. Uh, in recent years. So cell growth and division is a fundamental property of all living organisms. What's the point of um, the cell cycle of cell growth? Well, there's two consequences really to cell growth. You either increase the cell number, so in the case of a unicellular organism like bacteria or yeast, cells divide to make two cells. So one bacteria divides and then you have two bacteria. And that process generally continues driven by the availability of nutrients of uh, food in essence. It's a little more complex and a little different in multicellular organisms so obviously our cells don't divide to make another human not at least um, not on a day-to-day -day basis 
Uh, I've just had a new kid, and uh, you won't want a new child to look after every single day. You would uh, be severely suffering from lack of sleep in, in no short time at all. But cell division is occurring in our cells continually, obviously in the skin, in the epidermal cells uh, of the gut, of the lung. Uh, so cell division is a process that's continually happening. And in the case of multicellular organisms, that process is generally happening uh, in order to replace dead cells or cells which are no longer viable, uh, no longer performing their duty or their job correctly. So, on a basic level, a cell cycle begins with two daughter cells, which have been derived from the division of a single parental cell. And the cell cycle ends when those daughter cells themselves actually divide to produce a further two uh, new cells. And the process continues thus. So, it's exemplified here by this diagram. So, this will start at the end, which is um, cytokinesis. Uh, and cytokinesis is the division of the cytoplasm to produce two daughter cells. At this point we have entered a new cell cycle where the new daughter cell will grow in size till such a point that it decides to replicate its DNA. Once it's replicated its DNA, that DNA will then be segregated into two new daughter cells which will then, following DNA segregation, divide to again double the cell number present. So mitosis therefore, this process here, is the division of the nuclear material, the replicated DNA genome. Cytokinesis, which follows mitosis, is the division of the cytoplasm. And it's cytokinesis that snips and separates a dividing cell into two cells to complete and end the cell cycle. <coughs> so let's look at some of the stages of the cell cycle then and consider what's going on during these stages and um, how long they take and how they're regulated on a basic level. So let's start with a very interesting phase of the cell cycle, mitosis, or M phase, as it's called. So M phase was actually the first stage of the cell cycle, as we understand it today, to be observed by scientists. Um, and it's comprised of two linked events, mitosis and cytokinesis, as I've just been describing. So the reason it was one of the first observed events by scientists under the microscope is the fact that during M phase the nuclear material undergoes a series of structural changes in such a way that it becomes a lot easier to see via the light microscope. Chromosomes condense, align on something called the metaphase plate and then separate in a very visually striking process. We're going to talk about that in a lot more detail on the lecture, the following lecture to this on mitosis and meiosis. It says here that these two processes are linked. It's important that they're linked and it's important that they occur sequentially, obviously. You wouldn't want a cell to start dividing its cytoplasm prior to the division of the nuclear material. Obviously, if that did occur, then there's a strong likelihood that replicated chromosomes may end up in the wrong cellular compartment. In other words, one side of this um, dividing cell may end up with two uh, copies of a chromosome and the other side may end up with no copies of that chromosome. When this occurs, it can lead to something called aneuploidy, abnormal chromosome number, and obviously that's linked to several genetic disorders. For example, Down syndrome, which is a trisomy of chromosome 21. So chromosomal non-disjunction, to give it its proper name, this aberrant separation of chromosomes is something that we need to avoid. So it's important that mitosis and cytokinesis occur after one another and there are processes to ensure that that happens and we'll talk about later on in the lecture. Mitosis is quite a rapid process, a very rapid process in context of the remainder of the cell cycle. It amounts for only a small proportion of the time that the cell spends in the cell cycle, maybe 30 minutes to an hour. So once the DNA has been replicated, the cell doesn't stand around, it doesn't mess about, it, it makes a fairly rapid job of dividing those replicated genomes into two daughter cells and completing the cell cycle. So the next phase I want to just introduce is the G1 phase, the or growth 1 phase. And as the name suggests, this phase of the cell cycle, which is often the longest phase of the cell cycle, is where the cell will grow in size prior to the division, uh, prior, sorry, to the replication of its DNA. G1 is also the most uh, variable stage of the cell cycle. So G1 of some cells can last for weeks, uh, even months, 
whereas a G1 of other cells can be relatively short and rapid, depending on the purpose of the cell. Some cells which are required to divide very rapidly are very short G1s, where rapid cell division isn't as important, the G1 may, may be very long. As I've just said, the cells are effectively just growing in size, getting ready for division in G1. <coughs> this is more important in some cells than others. In fact, the trigger for replicating DNA uh, is linked to the actual size of the cell in some organisms, such as yeast. And it's important to realise that there are some cells which actually never escape G1, never progress to this S phase of the cell cycle. And instead of getting to the point where they decide to replicate the DNA, these cells exit the cell cycle at G1. So they kind of take a turn off on the motorway, so to speak, and decide to do something else instead. And that something else instead is to enter a phase called G0. Sometimes you'll also hear this referred to as quiescent. And what it means is that the cells have decided that there's no interest in actually continuing to divide at this point, and they're just going to enter, if you like, stasis, a restful state, where the cells continue perhaps to do other functions but are not engaged in the process of cell division. So as I had mentioned earlier on, examples of cells which are in G0 would include neuronal cells and um, cardiovascular cells, cardiomyocytes. Indeed, in the case of cardiomyocytes and neuronal cells, they're actually considered, another phrase that you might hear is that they're considered to have undergone something called terminal differentiation. And this phrase, terminal differentiation, doesn't mean that the cells are dead. The terminal refers to the fact that they've made a decision to differentiate, to change into a certain type of cell, and once that decision's been made, then those cells are incapable of actually doing anything else or re-entering the cell cycle and continuing to divide. So, with the exception of that subset of cells that enter this G0 phase, if we consider cells which are actively growing, like epithelial cells in the skin, the next phase of the cell cycle that the cells will enter is this so-called S phase, which stands for synthesis, uh, synthesis of DNA. So during S phase, the cell goes about the business of replicating its DNA genome. This is obviously an incredibly important process for the cell, and it's also an incredibly important decision that the cell makes with regards to whether or not it decides to enter S phase. The reason it's important is once the cell has entered S phase, once the cell's passed this so-called restriction mark here, or restriction point in G1, the cell is com committed in, in its entirety to complete in a full cell cycle. So once cells go past this restriction point in G1, they are there from therefore in committed to replicating their DNA dividing that DNA in mitosis and producing two new cells. There's no turning the clock back. So it's a point of no return, the restriction point. Now, DNA replication is a very complex process. You'll cover it um, in, cellular bi in, cellular, uh, sorry, in cell biology. You'll cover it in more detail in medical genetics at level three. One of the reasons it's, uh, it's a difficult process is that DNA replication uh, opens up the DNA ge genome to um, DNA damage. DNA damage is incredibly bad for the organism and for the unicellular organism as well. Uh, can result in cell death or in, in more, um, in some ways worse cases, it can result in disease such as cancer, as we'll talk about later on. There are checkpoints, which I mentioned at the beginning, beginning of the lecture, that are responsible for monitoring whether your DNA has been damaged. And these checkpoints can then manipulate the cell cycle, as we'll see later on in the lecture. So your cell enters S phase, it replicates its DNA, there are no damage events, everything's okay. It will then exit S phase and enter a phase called G2. G2 is a relatively short phase of, uh, in the cell cycle and it's a period of rapid growth, growth prior to M phase. Following replication of the DNA, basically G2 allows a cell to get everything ready and set up, ready for the division of the nucleus and the cytoplasm in M phase. There's an important checkpoint present at the interface between G2 and M phase that we'll talk about later on. But before we get on to the uh, nuts and bolts of looking at how these different checkpoints and how these different phases of the cell cycle are controlled at the molecular level, I just want to explain um, something about a tool that's very useful for studying in the lab uh, cell cycle phase. Uh, which phase of the cell cycle sorry, cells are actually in, in culture. And that's this so-called fluorescent active cell sorting technique, or FACS technique. 
So what the fax machine or fax techniques allows you to do is fluorescently sort cells. So you can do that by staining cells with a fluorescent dye. And in the case of a cell cycle analysis, this is a fluorescent dye that will bind to DNA. So if you imagine a situation where you have a cell in G1, so this is a cell that hasn't replicated its DNA yet. So one of the ways in which we talk about DNA in a G1 cell is that it is termed uh, to have, it's said to have 1N. So it has one genome copy in, a, in the cell of, of the DNA genome. Obviously a cell in S phase, which has completed replication of the genome, will have 2N copies of that genome because it's just replicated. And we can see the difference in the genome copy number using fax analysis by staining DNA in cells with this fluorescent dye. So what the fax machine actually does is it allows the individual detection of the fluorescent signal uh, in individual cells at a rate of around a thousand cells a second. So the cells get pushed through a very fine needle and each cell as it passes a needle is assessed for the amount of fluorescence that it gives off. And then, uh, uh, then what we generate then is, is, is this kind of data here seen in this graph. So on the y-axis here we have counts. So counts refers to the number of cells that have been counted or been assessed for the fluorescent signal. And as you can see, there's a very clear peak of cells here, which are exhibiting a certain uh, amount of fluorescence. Um, and the, this peak represents the largest population of cells um, that, we, that we've assessed in this cell culture. So what this peak actually represents are cells that are in either G0 or G1 of the cell cycle. So this peak represents cells which have 1N DNA. So these are cells which haven't replicated their DNA yet. Now if you look, we have a second sort of peak of cells here, further along with a higher fluorescence, almost double the fluorescence signal. So what this peak represents is that proportion of cells which have completed S phase and have 2N DNA in their cells and they're awaiting um, the completion of M phase and, the, um, and, and for cytokinesis and cell division to occur. Until that happens, as an individual cell passes this laser and its fluorescence is detected, we see that it gives off double the fluorescence of a G1 cell. For the simple reason it's got double the amount of DNA in there, because it's replicated its genome. We also see a bit of a, a distribution on this line here, a varying amounts of fluorescence. And these signals represent those cells which pass the laser, which are currently undergoing DNA replication. So they've not fully doubled the amount of DNA there yet, but they're in the process of doubling it, which is why you've got a sliding scale for fluorescence here. So the fax analysis allows you to look at the cell cycle stage of cells in a population very quickly and very easily. This data would take a few seconds to gather. That's very useful if you want to try and analyse what's going on with cells in the cell cycle. <clears throat> For example, you may think that you've identified a mutation which prevents the cells from entering S phase, which traps them in G1, in effect. And to assess whether or not you're right about that hypothesis, you could very easily and quickly look at cell cycle stage by fax analysis and what you would expect to see if that hypothesis is correct obviously is that you would have an even bigger peak here in G1 and this G2S phase peak would be absent because the cells were unable to exit G1 and divide and replicate their DNA. So DNA replication is obviously a key event in the cell cycle. So I just want to talk a little bit about how this um, process is regulated with regards to the cell cycle. You're going to cover DNA replication in another module later this semester, so I don't want to go into any more detail than appears on this slide. And you don't need to worry with regards to human genetics about any more detail than appears on this slide with regards to what you will be asking the, possibly asked in exams. So a couple of things then about the licensing of DNA replication. So... In the context of this lecture where we're thinking about the cell cycle, I've already mentioned that there are mechanisms in place which, once you pass the restriction point of the cell cycle, mean that the cell is committed to then completing the cell cycle in its entirety, to replicating its DNA and then dividing. Well, DNA replication itself is licensed or triggered, if you like, by the binding of um, a set of proteins called origin of replication complex proteins to the DNA and the subsequent recruitment of these so-called MCM proteins. So what you have on your human chromosomes are these regions along the chromosomes which basically map to the start points of DNA replication. So these are bits of the chromosomes that are going to start uh, replicating once S phase is initiated. And to these replication start points, 
this orc protein is recruited, followed by this MCM protein complex here. <coughs> the MCM proteins actually do the job of unwinding the double-stranded DNA helix prior to DNA replication, which then allows the DNA polymerases to move along the DNA, um, copying the information that's present in either daughter strand. So we don't need to worry about the mechanics of DNA replication, that's not what's important. What I want to get across from the point of view of the cell cycle lecture is how the cell regulates the process of DNA replication so that it only occurs once during the cell cycle and so that the DNA replication process can't occur at the wrong time during the cell cycle. So what happens is once the cell enters S phase of the cell cycle, DNA replication is triggered at these origins of replication via the action of a special type of protein called a kinase. So what kinase proteins do is they modify other proteins. You may have encountered this on biological molecules already. If you haven't, you'll be having a lecture about such things later on in the semester. Kinase proteins modify other proteins, and they modify proteins by adding or adding um, uh, sorry phosphate groups to the to the protein, generally on protein side chains. <clears throat> the addition of these phosphate groups often subtly changes the function of the protein. So in other words, a kinase can change the function of the protein, or if you want to think of it another way, a kinase can switch on and switch off protein activity. Yeah. In the case of DNA replication, what happens is the cycle-independent kinases, this special type of kinase, phosphorylate and switch on proteins which are needed for the initiation of DNA replication to begin. The reason you can only ever replicate your genome once during a cell cycle and that you don't get multiple rounds of replication occurring from these origin points is that once this kinase protein has triggered the process of DNA replication. It can't trigger it again because these proteins, the MCM protein, etc., are lost then from that actual replicator region of the chromosome and aren't recruited again until the following cell cycle. So it's quite a complex concept that you might need to have a read in the, in the, in the, in the course, recommended course textbook to, to allow that to solidify and for it to take hold. But to summarise again, DNA replication requires a phosphorylation of proteins that are present at these replicator sites in the chromosome. When phosphorylation occurs, DNA replication can begin. It can begin again during the same cell cycle because the proteins which the cycle-independent kinases are phosphorylating can only be recruited during the G1 phase of the cell cycle. So once you've entered S phase and you've triggered DNA replication, these proteins won't be found again at these replicator sites until after the completion of M phase and the following cell cycle has begun. So that's an insight into how DNA replication is controlled during the cell cycle. So how do you regulate the cell cycle um, with regards to other aspects of cell division? Well in vitro, if you look at a mammalian cell, it will generally take around 24 hours to complete a, a cell cycle. In other words, if you take human fibroblasts and you grow them in tissue culture in a flask, they will divide every 24 hours. In other words, cell number will double every 24 hours. In vivo, so in the body, those fibroblasts might take a lot longer or a lot shorter to divide. So there's great variation actually in the length of uh, the cell cycle between different cell types. The fact that there's such great variation between the cell cycle of different cells suggests or strongly suggests that there's tight regulation in place which allows the cell to choose how long or how quickly a cell can actually complete cell division. So in some instances it might be advantageous for the cell to divide incredibly quickly. In other instances it might be more advantageous if the cell division occurs quite slowly. And the point is there are processes available to the cell to regulate the cell cycle at that level. I've already told you that the most variation occurs actually in the G1 phase of the cell cycle so it's easiest for the cell to manipulate the cell cycle during G1. Once you actually trigger DNA replication it's kind of like you've cut the brakes and the car's rolling downhill at that point. So you can't really stop it and it's just going to move towards its completion at a rate that's kind of out of your control. <coughs> 
during G1, you can think of that as driving up the hill. It's put a lot easier to slow down, put the handbrake on, take a brake, whatever. But when you get to the top of the hill and cut the brakes and the car starts coming down the other side, you're committed then. You need to you pass a point of no return. You pass a restriction point of the cell cycle and you, you're committed to completing the rest of the cell cycle uh, in a pretty much consistent between cell type uh, amount of time. One of the prerequisites, as I mentioned, for some cells such as yeast and simple organisms uh, for entry into the cell cycle or if you like to get past this restriction point is that there's some cell growth in G1 phase. It's not always the case, some cells don't adhere to that. Um, the growth that occurs in G1 and the things that monitor growth in G1 in simple eukaryotic cells such as yeast are intimately linked to the availability of nutrients. <coughs> And there's similar mechanisms actually present in our cells as well, although it's a little bit more complex. So, for example, in human cells, it's not just a case of whether there is food present in the um, immediate surrounding area to which a cell is being grown. You also require active signals to be sent to the cell in order for cell division to, to, to uh, occur and to be triggered. Those signals are what we term growth factors. And these growth factors, in addition to just general nutrient levels, such as glucose, etc., can signal to key proteins within the cell, which in turn then form a kind of cascade, a waterfall effect, if you like, ultimately leading to the activation of a so-called master regulator of um, gene expression called mTOR. And what mTOR does then is it switches on the expression of all sorts of different genes that are involved in cell growth, including genes which... Um, are involved in driving cells through the cell cycle. So we consider the <coughs> existence of these master regulators of gene expression in the molecular biology of the gene lecture, the concept that you have these proteins which are able to control the expression of many other genes. mTOR falls into that category. So we know then from the fact that the cell cycle takes varying amounts of time to complete that there must be some type of regulatory mechanism present that controls the cell cycle. And having taken that as fact, then we need to think about what this mechanism actually needs to be able to do to achieve its job. And there are three things really that the cell cycle machinery needs to be able to do in order to function properly. One, it needs to make sure that the cell cycle stages are carried out at the correct time and in the correct order. It's very important. You don't want to start dividing your DNA. Sorry, you don't want to start sorry, separating your DNA prior to actually re replication of the DNA. Similarly, you don't want to start dividing your cell prior to the division of the nuclear material. Everything has to occur in the order that it's laid out in this diagram. Otherwise, aberrations will occur in regards to the passing on of the genetic information. Similarly, each stage must be complete before you start the next stage. So it's no good replicating 99% of your genome and then suddenly G2 phase and M phase beginning. You need to make sure that these phases do not start until every single nucleotide of the 4 billion nucleotides in your genome has been accurately and faithfully copied and that there has been no damage to those 4 billion nucleotides. Yeah? You have a lecture on DNA damage mechanisms next year, in year two, but it's an immensely challenging task for the cell. There are four billion nucleotides to monitor to make sure that they've been faithfully and accurately copied into in the in the newly synthesized daughter genome. Any damage that occurs during that process needs to be monitored. Yeah, and this is occurring, don't forget, across millions of cells every every day in your body, this process. And finally, the cell cycle needs to be responsive to external signals. So in, contra in contradiction to that analogy I gave a moment ago about the car rolling down the hill with the brakes cut, we need to have some kind of way we can throw a roadblock up to that car if we need to. If the brakes are cut and the car's rolling downhill, if S phase is proceeding and DNA has been replicated and there's some catastrophic event... If there's major damage to the DNA, we need a way of telling the cell to, whoa, stop replicating the DNA till we've fixed this damage. So the cell cycle needs to be responsive to external signals which monitor the cell cycle and make sure everything's going ahead okay.
So all of these events are accomplished by a group of proteins that act at specific points during the cell cycle. Generally, they act at transition points between the cell cycle. G1S phase, S phase G2, G2M phase. These transition points between the cell cycle is where proteins generally act to accomplish these three criteria that we've just talked about here above. So what are these things then? Well, I already mentioned in the introduction and earlier on that it is the cycle-independent kinase proteins that really are the heartbeat of the cell cycle. <coughs> so what are these proteins? How were they identified? Well, initially, cycle-independent kinase was, were identified by a group of scientists, which included um, Leland Hartwell and Paul Nurse, uh, who were working in the late 70s on a particular type of yeast called Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Saccharomyces cerevisiae is a, is a budding yeast. It's the yeast used to make bread. It's also the yeast used to make beer. The derivative of it is used by Carlsberg to make lager. The interesting thing from a scientific point of view, aside from the fact it makes beer, is that Saccharomyces cerevisiae as a budding yeast is an excellent model organism for the study of the cell cycle. Why is it a good model organism for the study of the cell cycle? Well, if you've got a circular cell, such as a human mammalian cell, it's very tricky for, to actually tell at what point that cell is in the cell cycle by just looking at it down a microscope. In contrast, budding yeast is exquisitely um, placed to act as a model system for the cell cycle because actually its morphology, its cell shape, mirrors the cell cycle process. That is to say that if you have a cell in G1 phase, what you generally have is a round, unbudded cell. If you see a cell with a very small bud that has just started to emerge, this will be a cell that's undergoing DNA replication. Similarly, if you have a cell with a very large bud, this will be a cell that's probably in G2 phase. And where you see two cell, two, uh, a yeast cell with a bud almost as large as the mother cell, this will be a cell that's undergoing mitosis. So by looking at the shape of the yeast cell, scientists could tell at what point in the cell cycle these cells were at. And what Hartwell and Nurse noticed is that if you induce mutations in the yeast uh, cells, in other words, if you damage the yeast DNA intentionally with the aim of generating specific mutants in genes, you could occasionally identify a group of mutants which would have a very interesting phenotype. And that phenotype would be that when you grew the cells in culture and then looked at them down the microscope, every single cell would have exactly the same morphology. In other words, every single cell may look like this cell here. So what does that tell the scientists? Well, what Hartwell and Nurse realised is it told them that they probably mutated a gene that was responsible for the control of the cell cycle. And that by mutating that gene, they kind of thrown a roadblock up to the cells in such a way that all cells suddenly arrested at that point in the cell cycle. For this cell here, it might be an arrest in S phase. Yeah. What that allowed them to do is to analyse a whole range of different mutants, which had different phenotypes depending on cell cycle arrest. And by doing those experiments, he eventually led them to the discovery of a kinase called CDC2. What CDC2 turns out to be is a very important kinase that's responsible for driving the cells into M phase, into mitosis. So this was a big deal, and Hartwell and Nurse won the Nobel Prize for Medicine in 2000 um, for the discovery of, 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 of CDC2 in the cell cycle dependent kinase proteins, along with another scientist called Tim Hunt. CDC2 is particularly important because it's the kinase that the cell needs in order to enter mitosis. So in other words, once it has replicated its DNA, a cell needs the activity of this CDC2 kinase protein to drive the cells then into mitosis, into M phase, and for the DNA material to uh, separate and the cytokinesis to complete. The interesting thing about CDC2, the thing that got everybody excited about it, was just how well conserved it was between other organisms. So it's not just yeast that has this CDC2 kinase. This kinase exists in every single living higher order organism on the planet. From yeast, through to mouse, through to dog, through to human, through to ape, through to whatever. In fact, it's so well conserved, this protein, that you can take the yeast CDC2 gene, put it into a human cell, and it will work 
it will still do the job of driving the cells into M phase perfectly fine. There's very, very few examples of genes which are that highly conserved in nature between such disparate organisms as yeast and man. And what that kind of conservation points towards is very important function for that protein. A, a protein here that's absolutely essential for life. So essential that it's been hardly evolved at all from the point at which it was originally evolved in yeast many, many um, billions of years ago. Certainly hundreds of millions of years ago. Now another fact about the CDC2 gene product, the CDC2 protein, is that it's actually only works CDC2 and the other uh, kinases that drive the cell cycle also are in the same situation that they only actually work when they're bound to another protein called a cyclin. So what are these cyclin um, proteins? And we'll talk about that in a second. But this is where the name cyclin dependent kinase arises from. CDC2 is the kinase but it is dependent upon the binding to another protein called a cyclin. So you've got two proteins bound together a kinase and a cyclin, and together they form these cyclin-dependent kinase proteins, which are the engine room of the cell cycle, which drive the cell cycle transitions as the cell divides. <clears throat> so if the cyclins are required for the C these kinase proteins to work, how are the cyclins and the CDKs themselves then regulated? Well, the cyclins were actually identified in work by Tim Hunt and others um, who were looking at the time at frog, uh, frog oocytes, so Xenopus larvae. And what they identified was a presence of a so-called mitotic cycling that was required for the activation of a factor they'd identified in these uh, frog eggs called MPF, or maturation promoting factor, uh, sometimes called mitosis promoting factor. So what this mitosis promoting factor turns out to be is the frog homologue, the frog variant of the CDC2 protein from yeast. Yeah, so it's conserved in frogs, it's MPF. It only works MPF when it's bound to this cycling that they identified in the frog oocytes. And what they saw that what was interesting was that the expression of um, this actual uh, cycling that bound to MPF was changing drastically during the cell cycle. So if you looked at frog eggs that were in, that were in mitosis, what you would see is that the cycling was at a very high level in those cells. However, once mitosis was complete and you were back in G1, this cycling very rapidly, along with CDK activity, was degraded. And then slowly throughout the cell cycle, it will build back up until such a point that it reaches critical mass, if you like, during the following mitosis of the, of the next cell division. So how are these cycling proteins being degraded then built back up during the cell cycle? I don't want to go into too much detail, but effectively there's another protein complex involved in this called the anaphase promoting complex, or APC. And what this is, if you like, is a garbage truck for the cell. It's a seek and destroy device that the cell uses for targeting proteins and degrading them very rapidly in a controlled manner. And the APC targets cycling proteins at the end of mitosis and rapidly degrades them. And by doing that, it prevents the onset of another mitosis. It prevents the division of the nuclear material until such a point that this cycling expression is high again, which can only occur following the successful completion of S phase in the next cell cycle. So you can read a little bit more about how the APC fits into the cell cycle machine in the recommended textbooks, but I'm going to give another example of a, a more detailed example about how it functions here now today. So... If we forget about mitotic cyclins um, for a moment and consider another role of the APC um, that's also critical to a successful completion of cell division, and that's in uh, mitosis. So what you have towards the end of mitosis uh, effectively are two replicated chromosomes. So this is a chromosome, the parental chromosome, and this is the newly replicated chromosome. And those chromosomes exist next to each other and actually interwound in a structure called sister chromatids. So these sister, these chromatids, these replicated chromosomes are actually held together by a protein called cohesin. So this is the parent chromosome, this is a newly synthesized chromosome at the end of S phase. And these two replicated chromosomes are actually held together by this kind of, if you like, ring structure called cohesin that wraps around the two uh, double-stranded DNA molecules. Now at the correct time during the cell cycle, what actually happens is that the anaphase promoting complex, the APC, 
targets and degrades another protein called securin, which up until that point are bound to an inactivated a third protein called separase. Once free, separase rapidly degrades cohesin and allows the replicated chromosomes to separate. <clears throat> I'm not sure if this video will work on the podcast, but hopefully it will work in the lecture because uh, it gives you a good example of this process um, in action. So let's see if this is going to work. No. Ah, yeah, here we go. So I've got it working. Hopefully this is still going to uh, look okay on the podcast. I'll try and play this again. So what you can see in the cell here is the cell is uh, speeded up during the cell cycle. And what we're looking at is a cell that's undergoing uh, the cell cycle. It's replicating its DNA, it's entering mitosis, and then it's dividing. So you can see the chromosomes align and align and then suddenly fly apart as two, into two separate cells. One more time, they align, they're held for a second, then suddenly very rapidly fly apart. And that rapid separation is what's facilitated by the APC and these group of three proteins called heating, securing and separates. So there's another example here of the same thing. This time what we're looking at is a presence of securing in the cell. So securing is labelled with a red colour. As the cells line up and ready to divide, securing is suddenly completely degraded. The red colour completely vanishes from these cells. So that's a very complex process. Uh, I'll try and explain it in the lecture as well, a little clearer. It's hard to do podcasts and show videos uh, and, and annotate those videos as, as we're going through the podcast. But hopefully, you know, you got the impression what was going on there. So there's a few major transition points, as I've already mentioned, during the cell cycle. The, the other major transition point of the cell cycle is the uh, S phase entry transition point. So this is a key decision for the cell. So this, is, this relates to this restriction point of the cell cycle. So all cells that are growing in G1 eventually need to make the decision of whether they're going to continue through the cell cycle into S phase and complete a full round of cell division or whether they're going to exit the cell cycle and enter G0. Now the key protein which regulates entry into S phase is actually a protein called retinoblastoma or RB. Now, in G1 phase cells, RB is bound to and inactivates a protein called E2F. E2F is a transcription factor, so we've encountered these already. Like some of the other transcription factors we've talked about, E2F is responsible for the turning on of gene transcription for a whole range of different gene targets. So it's a master regulator of gene transcription. It just so happens that a lot of the genes which E2F turn on are the genes that are required for the onset of DNA replication, etc., in other words, the onset of S phase. So in G1, E2F can't trigger these S phase gene expression, can't trigger the expression of these S phase genes because it's bound to an inactivated by RB. Now what happens during G1 is if the cell receives a strong enough signal from growth factors, as we discussed earlier on, signaling occurs within the cytoplasm of the cell that ultimately leads to the activation of a cycling dependent kinase. This cycling-dependent kinase, remember, is a kinase protein that phosphorylates other proteins to switch them on and off. And what this cycling-dependent kinase does is it phosphorylates the RB protein. And in this particular instance, phosphorylation of RB causes it to let go of E2F. And E2F, the transcription factor, can then go about the business of turning on gene transcription for a whole range of genes which are needed for entry into S phase. So RB is a very important protein. It's a tumor suppressor protein. If you actually inactivate or mutate RB, you deregulate this process and you allow cells to divide when they shouldn't divide, which effectively is cancer. And another another way of say, call it, uh, describing cancer. In fact, there are certain viruses which are known to cause cancer, such as HPV, which is a virus associated with cervical cancer, who have developed uh, who express proteins. Um, that specifically target and inactivate RB in order to drive cells through the cell cycle. Obviously, all a virus wants to do is infect a cell and then have that cell divide rapidly in order to assist the virus's replication process. So it's in the virus's best interest sometimes to inactivate some of the checkpoints that exist to prevent uh, dysregulated cell division in cells. 
<clears throat> so whilst we're on the topic of checkpoints, let's explore this concept a little further. So we've talked about some of the processes which are required in order to drive the cell through these transition points of the cell cycle. We've talked about CDC2, which is needed to drive cells into M phase. We've talked about cycle independent kinases and RB, which is responsible for the control of entry into, into S phase from G1. But what happens if things go wrong during the cell cycle? What happens if we need to put a break on things because something untoward happens? So several checkpoints exist. Uh, and I'm just going to take you through a few of them now. So there's a checkpoint which monitors DNA replication. If DNA replication is not complete, the cell needs to prevent the entry of, of the cell into, into M phase. So in other words, you don't want to start dividing your nuclear material, material until all the chromosomes are fully, fully replicated. So this net, network of protein interactions here achieves that. If you have unreplicated DNA, that triggers the expression of a specific kinase protein. What that kinase protein does is it phosphorylates the CDC2 cycle independent kinase. So remember, CDC2 kinase is needed for the, the uh, transition into M phase. And by phosphorylating it, it actually inactivates CDC2 kinase so that it can't promote M phase entry. So the presence of unreplicated DNA directly inactivates CDC2. And it's only once this signal's lost and the DNA is fully replicated that this kinase signal is lost and CDC2 can then promote entry into the actual M phase of the cell cycle. Similarly, during DNA replication, DNA damage events can occur. There can also occur other points throughout the cell cycle as a consequence of ionizing radiation or UV radiation. When these kinds of DNA damage events occur, they are sensed by the cell via a number of different proteins that all more or less lead to this protein p53 which we discussed briefly in the last lecture p53 is often called the guardian of the genome and what it is is it's a sensor for dna damage when p53 is activated and stabilized it induces the expression of a protein called p21 also called waf or cyp1 and this p21 protein in a similar way to what the system how the system works here inactivates the actual cycle independent kinases that are required for the entry of the cell into S phase. So in other words, if there's DNA damage occurring, the P53 protein can arrest cells prior to actual S phase entry and DNA replication. Alternatively, P53 can also tell the cell to commit suicide, to commit apoptosis. So apoptosis or programmed cell death is a last resort that an organism may use if a cell has undergone DNA damage that cannot be repaired and may lead to gene genetic instability and subsequently disease such as cancer. P53 can get, send signals to that cell telling it to kill itself in effect and commit suicide so as not to pass on any DNA damage to subsequent generations. And finally we have another checkpoint which acts at the M phase boundary now. This is a mitotic spindle checkpoint and this checkpoint is responsible for making sure that cells do not divide, sorry, that, that replicated chromosomes do not separate until they are fully aligned on the so-called metaphase plate. You'll learn more about the metaphase plate of mitosis in the next lecture. In essence, you do not want chromosomes to separate from one another until they are correctly aligned. If the chromosomes start separating before they're aligned, you can end up with aneuploidy, abnormal numbers of chromosomes being inherited into daughter cells during cell division. So three very important checkpoint control mechanisms there for the cycle. So that's how you stop the cell cycle if something goes wrong. How do you get it started in the first place? I've alluded to these growth factors, etc. I'm going to give you a bit more detail about them now. So unicellular organisms, eukaryotes like yeast, if you give them food, they'll start dividing in a similar way to bacteria. We're a little bit more complex. Um, there is a link between food and sex, I think, but you know, I don't think it's as direct as it is in bacteria. So for us, the cell cycle is triggered and inhibited, actually, by the action of growth factors. So you can have positive growth factors or inhibitory growth factors. So a good example of a growth factor would be the epidermal growth factor and fibroblast growth factor system that exists in our cells. So all of these systems work via a similar mechanism. You have a soluble growth factor, which is external to the cell and able to bind to a transmembrane receptor that exists at the surface of the cell membrane. So let's take the FGF receptor as an example. Fibroblast growth factor will bind to the fibroblast growth factor receptor. When it binds, that will trigger a change in the receptor that will lead to this kind of cascade effect throughout the cytoplasm. 
So this is what's called a signalling cascade or a signal transduction mechanism. You'll learn more about these in other courses on the module. Effectively, if you can think of it like a domino effect, as each protein activates the next in the cascade until ultimately you elicit a change in the gene expression profile of the cell. In the instance shown here for S phase entry, that gene expression profile involves the activation of the cycle independent kinases needed to drive entry into S phase. In other words, the cycle independent kinase is needed to phosphorylate RB and release the E2F transcription factor from its control. Similarly, there are anti proliferative signals as well that can turn off gene expression and turn off cell cycle progression. Here we've got interleukin-6, TGF-beta, um, which can, again, via a signaling mechanism, lead to the inactivation of cycle-independent kinases and prevention of the cell uh, entering, entering M phase. So just to summarise then what we've talked about, we've talked about how the cell cycles are effectively an engine that drives cell growth that's comprised of four stages. You need to understand that these four stages have transition points, G1S, G2M phase, and that it's at these transition points that mechanisms exist for regulating entry into the next phase of the cell cycle. There are also complex checkpoints which oversee the cell cycle, make sure that any dam damage hasn't been occurred, and then can manipulate the cell cycle until any subsequent damage has been resolved. Finally, we've talked about signaling cascades and how they regulate entry into the cell cycle in multicellular organisms. So this is a relatively complex topic for a level one module. Um, it's going to require a little bit of extra work, I'm sure, on your part to fully understand it. But like a lot of molecular biology mechanisms, it's, it's about understanding the mechanism, the process. And uh, if you look at the core textbook, there's an excellent chapter on, on cell cycle control. And you can look at other textbooks as well, such as Molecular Biology of the Cell, which I believe is a core textbook for cell biology, which will also have a good chapter on explaining cell cycle control in eukaryotic cells. So thanks for your attention. I hope this proves useful during revision and look out for more lectures in the series. Thank you.